Okay, good evening, everyone. Hello, my name is Simon Jacobson, and I welcome you all, as well as the web audience, wherever you are in the world. Um, <clears throat> I wish I was able to ask this to everyone out there, but uh, uh, I'll ask at least here. Does anybody here, would anybody here categorize themselves as a, uh, as a lost soul? There we go. We have one volunteer. I know it's a it's a um, sensitive question, and I understand from you're not raising your hand doesn't mean you aren't. You just don't want to discuss it. Let's put it this way. And I, so no conclusive. Uh, fine. But uh, Jeff, I guess you've been to a lot of therapy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, uh, just for the record, if it may make if it's a consolation. The Kabbalists explain that all of us are lost souls. Every one of us. Um, those that are aware of it are actually on a higher level than those that are not. And you see, the reason for that is because we live in a material world and uh, it's dominated by um, tangible senses and everything we experience with our physical tools our sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell, what we see, what we hear, what we taste, and touch, and smell. And uh, a soul feels like a stranger in this world. As a matter of fact, there's an entire elaborate process to convince or actually to uh, uh, entice or uh, to actually coerce and force a soul to come down to this earth. There's a Mishnah in the Pirkei Avot in um, the ethics of the fathers that we study and read in the weeks between Passover and Shavuos, these weeks, there's six chapters, so each of the six Shabbos is between Passover and Shavuos, each week we read another chapter. So there's an expression there, al karcha chatechai, that God commands and tells the soul, you must come down to this earth. Because the soul on its own does not want to come. Because when it gives one look at this, what this world looks like, it, it doesn't. Well, who? Which pure soul would want to enter this uh, universe? You know. Besides, for the issues of uh, that, a soul does not have issues of health, livelihood, eating, sleeping, all the material needs that we have to survive. Then there's all the corruption and greed and pain and suffering that we uh, perpetuate, perp perpetuate at, on each other against each other. So a soul doesn't want to come to this earth. And nevertheless, it's commanded to do so. And the comparison is to a flame. When you look at a flame burning, so you see a flame in a wick. <coughs> the flame is constantly rising upward, licking the ear as if it wants to, doesn't want to be here. And if there was no wick, it look, if you think of the flame, it would just like expire to the heaven itself. So the example given is Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam, the soul of a human being is a flame of God. So like a flame, the soul is constantly searching and looking upward, yearning for something better than this universe. Even as it exists in this world, which is really the root of all our restlessness and all our um, even anxiety and angst because of a soul that is not happy, not satisfied, not content. So there's a restlessness. And that actually is healthy. It's healthy not to just be um, you know, ignorance is bliss, animal bliss, to just live a uh, mediocre and passive life. It's a healthy thing to have a certain, fo a certain measure of restlessness and angst, which is what motivates and drives us to want to succeed and grow in every possible way. It's only when it's out of proportion, when the angst turns into anxiety and into fear and into um, uh, other forces that debilitate us, that's when it's, it's too much. So you need to have tension and resolution. But the concept of a soul looking for something deeper and greater is very much what makes us human and what makes us special. So the soul is really a wandering creature on this earth. It has not, that never becomes comfortable with uh, circumstances in this material world. So in that sense, the soul is a lost entity here. Lost in the sense that it's not at home. You know, it's away from home. Whereas in, in heaven, in the spiritual planes, a soul is in its own habitat, it's in its own environment. 
where it's comfortable and doesn't have to deal with the challenges. Here a soul is essentially a slave to the body. And uh, the body and its bodily needs and our own selfish desires and self-interest decide we want to do something, we force the soul to go along with us. The soul is, hence, in other words, the force of energy that gives us life. In truth is, the way it should work is the other way around, which is the whole purpose of existence, is that the soul should be the captain of the ship, and the body should just be the vehicle. But well, imagine the vehicle telling the captain where to go. Well, that's very much what our lives are like, where the material needs and our, and our immediate needs drive our interests, and in turn, the soul has to go along, it has no choice. It's locked in your body. And it's your choice. So the soul, in, a very many, in many ways, is lost in this world. As I say, some are more lost than others. And it's part of the theme, this is the theme I want to discuss this evening. Um, it's also in context of the today. Today is a special day in the Hebrew calendar. That's the 14th of, um, 14th, 15th of year, which is the called Pesach Sheni, the second Passover, second Pesach, which is based on an uh, episode in the Bible, in the Torah, in the book of Numbers, chapter Baal the story goes that, um, I'll read it straight from the source, chapter 9, verse 1, in the book of Numbers, 9, a, 9 1. <coughs> God speaks to Moses in the, in, the, in the Sinai wilderness. This is the second year from when they went out of Egypt. So it's a year exactly from the year from they left Egypt. And it says to them, the Jews should do, obviously, to observe Passover in its time, which is on the 14th um, day of Nisan. Leading into the 15th, they should bring the Passover, the Paschal Lamb, and uh, observe Passover. And the Torah continues and says that's exactly what they did. But then it continues and something happens. There were people, says there were a group of people who at the time, time of Passover were ritually impure. The expression is tmeim lenefesh adam. They were impure either as a result of a death in the family or anything like that. It's a spiritual impurity that did not allow them to um, bring the offering, the Passover offering, on the, on the regular scheduled day, which is the 15th of, 14th, 15th of Nisan. And these people came over to uh, Moses and said, and Moses and Aaron, and said, um, we were impure during Passover. Lam Nigara, why should we be deprived? Why should we be deprived and prevented from bringing this offering just because we it was not our choice that we were impure. Moses says to them, he has to ask God what to do. It was a situation that he could not resolve on his own. So this verse continues and says that God he speaks to God, and God tells him to tell the people as follows. And we have here a new mitzvah that came as a result of this request, of this demand, or this, this uh, beseeching of the people that were impure. And the mitzvah goes like this, tell them that any person... This is God saying to Moses, this is the mitzvah. Every per, any person who's tummy the nefesh, who for whatever reason is became spiritually, spiritually impure, or was bederech rechika, was in a distant um, road, meaning they were far away from the temple during Passover, because the, 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 the Passover offering had to be brought to the temple, so they were away from the temple. To either you now or in generations to come, they shall choose a month from Passover, which is the 15th of year. This is exactly one month ago was Passover from today. On this day, they shall bring the offering. And in other words, and this forever is called Pesach Sheni. It doesn't have all the laws of Passover as the initial Passover, which is eight, seven day, seven, eight day holiday, and many other details. For example, not eating the bread, eating matzah, all those, all those elements don't exist in the, second, in the second Passover. However, we do, in the time of the temple, this was an opportunity for people who missed the, the, the boat, essentially, who were not able to bring the offering into the temple, either for one of these two reasons, because of impurity or because of distance. This was an opportunity for them to complement it. 
uh, to fulfill it. And then forever, this is called Pesach Sheni. Even now, today, when the temple is destroyed, obviously we don't bring offerings, but there are some customs of this day, including not saying certain tachnun, that's a somewhat of a semi-holiday. Some people, many have the custom of tasting some matzah. But these are customs. But the day still remains part of our calendar. And uh, what is the message, essentially? So one of the Hasidic rabbis says, the message of Pesach Sheni, Pesach Sheni which means the second Passover, is asinishtokim farfaun in Yiddish, which means that there's never too late. Essential messages, ultimately, is that even those people seemingly, you could say, well, you know, too bad. You weren't around, or you couldn't bring an offering. Time passed, and that's it. There are many things you missed, you missed the opportunity. You missed the opportunity. There are many things in Judaism, even, that uh, if they missed the day, you can't do anything about it. You know, if, uh, uh, for example, other holidays, when sukkah sends, there's no sitting in a sukkah the day next day or next month. You didn't do it. You didn't do it. And different offerings in the temple also, it says, over his money, bottle carbone, the time passed. Time-sensitive mitzvahs, basically, you cannot do later. For example, daily mitzvahs even. There are certain mitzvahs that were incumbent upon us every day. A person misses prayers during one day. The question is, can he pray twice the next day? The answer is no. You can't. There are mitzvahs that are not time-sensitive. For, for example, charity. You, want to give, you, want, you didn't give charity that day, you can give the next day twice as much. But time-sensitive mitzvahs that are connected to time period, whether it's a day, a month, a year, and so on, you cannot do later. There are many reasons given for it. Ultimately, the reason, but the main reason is because the mitzvah is connected to the time. It's not just about doing the act, it's also about refining the time. For example, Shabbos, you light a Friday candle Shabbos, Friday night, before sundown. If you missed it, you can't light it Saturday night or Sunday night, because the time is not then. The energy of that moment is gone. And, then, and it's about sanctifying that particular time and moment. So one exception, is, however, is this episode here. It's, it is an exception. And that's why Moses couldn't answer it on his own. Because on his own, Moses would have said, what am I supposed to tell you? There's no all the mitzvahs. You miss it. That's it. You do it next year. But since they cried out, Lama Negara, why are we deprived? Why should we be deprived of such an important experience? He turned to God, and God did grant them this request. So we have here the lesson that there is never too late. It's never too late. Which, of course, extends to all many, many areas, not just the Passover. It extends to anything in life that we always know there's a second chance. In some instances, the second chance is a physical. Like in this case, they can bring the offering. But even there, we also understand that it's not quite the same experience as the first main Passover, which has a Seder, and has all the details that a Passover, say, that Passover the holiday has. But it gave, them, it gave us an opening that there is that opening. And in other mitzvahs, even if you miss it, what your lesson is, it's never too late. You can always do tshuva. You can always repair the past. And there are many things that can be derived from this message. It's never too late. I mean, Yom Kippur is a similar story. Yom Kippur is all about forgiveness, repairing hope, even after there was a break, even after there was betrayal. Yom Kippur teaches us the power of rehabilitation, regenerating, renewing our lives. And of course, it's a fundamental theme in Judaism in general. There's no such thing as something is broken forever. Damaged goods, there's no such thing. Because that by virtue of the fact that we have a soul, and a soul is a piece of God, part of God. So just as God cannot be damaged goods, so our soul cannot full ultimately be damaged goods. And therefore, even when some things are damaged on outer layers, on the inner layers, there's no real damage done. It would be the equivalent of, uh, God forbid, a person gets, um, uh, gets burned. So the burn may affect some of the layers of the skin, even if it's a serious burn. But there is a point where it does not affect. Now, with a burn, the example is not complete, because burns, we know burns can affect and ultimately kill somebody. But when it comes to a soul... We understand it as being like layers. And the outer layers can be severed and can be hurt, but the inner essence always remains connected. That doesn't justify being a criminal or doing something wrong. It means that you have hope to reconnect. And reconnecting, in a sense, like almost like after a stroke victim, uh, a person suffers a stroke, 
We know today that nerves can regrow, go back, grow back, and even actually bypass the area of damage. It's the same thing in this case when a person has made a mistake, whether intentional or unintentional, they have the ability to correct it, repair it, what we call tshuva. Tshuva means to return. You know, if you think about it, the word return seems odd. It should be repentance, which is usually how people translate tshuva, actually is the opposite of returning. When you regret something, you're going away from it. You did something wrong, you move away from it. So why is it called return? You're not returning to the mistake. The answer is because Shuvah is returning to the essence where the mistake did not have any impact. In other words, returning to the essential person that transcends the area there was damage. Which is really the essence of all healing in this world. And I've discussed this many times here, conversations I've had with therapists and healers and psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, always... Um, it always surprised me how does somebody work in the healing industry of helping people heal from, from uh, wounds and scars in their lives. They don't really believe that there's a soul that has the power to heal. Because if you think about it from purely a fatalistic, a type of um, uh, Darwinian, uh, Freudian model where, you know, survival of the fittest some people have been hurt, and that's it. Too bad. You have a wound, and that's it. Where do you have the power to heal after you've been hurt? Where's the power to rebuild after betrayal, after abuse, after a violation of a person's uh, boundaries? Whatever form of it, whether it's physical abuse or psychological, emotional, sexual abuse. You'd think that based on a principle that dog eats dog in a world where Survival of the fittest is the key, the cardinal rule. You think, okay, that's it. It's too bad. You can't really turn the clock back. That damage has been done, and that's all. Judaism teaches that the soul always remains intact. No matter what happens in your life, the soul will never be fundamentally damaged. The connections between the soul and your body can be damaged, like in the stroke with the with the with the with the nerves or the arteries can be blocked. A person can have a healthy heart, but if the arteries are clogged, it could affect the heart from pumping blood to the, in, a, in a smooth way, in a seamless way, to the organs of the body. So the same truth is here. The soul can be very powerful, but a person can sever the connection on many different levels, but the soul itself remains intact. So I'm not suggesting the work isn't hard work to be done, but there's hope. It means going back to the reservoir. Think of it like a, uh, the soul being a reservoir of very abundant amount of very refresh, fresh water. And then something happens in life that that water, uh, I'm sorry, before I say this, something happens, and that water, we draw that water through, a, whether it's through a spring of water, through a well, or we create rivers, or we create channels that draw that water, and we're able to benefit, nourish, drink from it, and nourish ourselves. But then something happens. Something causes those arteries, causes those uh, rivers to dry up. Something blocks them. Someone even goes and intentionally blocks them. What happens? The water remains in the reservoir, but it's now not being channeled into your life. That's like essentially a soul that has great potency and potential, but it remains dormant like asleep and locked inside of you. Essentially, when we are born, that's what our soul is like. It's a, it's a soul that is a complete state of potential. As we grow in, from, in through childhood, a healthy home where there's nurturing, where there's love, where there's acceptance, helps a person feel comfortable enough to allow their soul to emerge. Basically, all of education, all our training, all our growth, is that reservoir of, of, for, of power within our soul. And each person has their own soul, their own unique skills and talents. Each of us, is growing toward building the confidence and the skills to be able to draw from our soul into our actually day-to-day -day lives. So in the healthiest sense of the word, you'd have is that the person grows into an adult, their soul has full expression. Not full expression, much expression. What happens in an abusive environment, in an unhealthy, dysfunctional environment, or one where your skills are not taught, what happens is the soul remains trapped and locked inside itself, and it doesn't have the confidence to express itself on a very simple level. 
Someone growing up, for example, in a home where the parent, a parent or parents were abusive, very angry, and silenced the child and punished the child and was a very uh, called, um, uh, a dark home. What happens? The child begins to shrink into himself or herself and the soul doesn't feel comfortable to come out, to express itself. A person like that may have great, great skills and powers and talents, but was never allowed to uh, emerge. Uh, this happens, unfortunately, more often than not. I've seen it. And the challenge later in life is to help a person build the confidence and uh, nurture themselves or others nurturing them to be able to feel co confident enough to express themselves in that way. You know, some of us are naturally shy people. Shyness often is confused by people who are not trained or not sensitive with, uh, uh, with uh, being inadequate, you know. In, in a classroom, each class you have children that don't express themselves or don't speak. And many people who just are very shallow see that as, okay, the child has nothing to say or they're stupid or whatever it is. When it could be a brilliant person who's just never taught or just by nature, by personality, disposition, doesn't feel comfortable communicating, whatever it may be. You know, they, uh, since the king's speech has become such a uh, phenomenon, you know, and stuttering, uh, people talk about that. Stutterers, essentially, are people who are extremely sensitive people. And uh, their sensitivities, they don't stutter when they're alone. And they don't stutter when they're extremely comfortable. It's all about being judged by others, and uh, that, uh, especially if growing up in a home that, that uh, is very demanding or very aggressive or very domineering. Doesn't mean every domineering creates stuttering, but it's just an example of a person who could be fully capable fully intelligent, even brilliant, is just a form of expression that has been impeded, usually due to circumstances in life. Now there are, there are obviously stutters that, that certain, certain has to do with a speech defect from birth, stuff like that, but I'm talking about the more, the more conventional one. I don't know if you know this, but one, uh, four out of five stutters are men, not women. It's interesting uh, the statistic. I wrote about this once in context of Moses. The point, however, I'm making here is that we have two parts to us. We have our, we'll call it inner sanctum, our inner self, our inner soul, with brimming with full kinds of powers and potential to the point that none of us really even know how much we have within us. Even you yourself are not aware of your own power and potential. Sometimes things you do in, by accident, you, you know, you're in the middle of a project with others and there's no one to do something, you end up doing the job, you suddenly realize you're good at it. It happens in our teen years, in school, in camp, you know, summer camp, when we travel. It's usually when we're challenged or when we're in a situation where nobody's taking care of us. Suddenly you have to take care of yourself and you become very resourceful. And most of these uh, discoveries are usually by accident. We're blessed. Maybe you meet a mentor that recognizes something in you and they help cultivate it. They help nurture it, help you build it and help you express it. But most, in most situations that's not the case. I don't want to go through every scenario. The point I'm making here is that the soul is a formidable force trapped in a material body, in a material world, like I said earlier, lost in a way. And as such, it has all kinds of strength. It has the strength to regenerate and the strength of hope and the strength of rebuilding after loss and healing after damage. So when someone understands and relates and believes in your soul, then it makes sense that no matter what you've gone through in your life, that soul, however can be accessed, and maybe now you have to reach deeper in order to heal from some type of damage. And that's what I was saying earlier, I've always wondered how does someone who doesn't believe in that, that's not about a belief, who doesn't believe in a person, how could you take their money, and good money, in therapy, and not, when you don't believe that they really can heal? I mean, why don't you announce to them and tell them that, you know, something, I'm taking your money, but, only, but I don't really believe anything's going to change. And I've, I've met therapists who are very seemingly ethical, but they just don't, they, you know, they, to me, when I say this to them, they say, you can't mix God and soul into therapy, you have to be detached and so on. I, and for me, it's not a religious issue here. It's an issue of what is a person's capacity, potential. You, could put, you, could, you can phrase it in completely secular terms. We definitely, let's put it this way, dead people don't go to therapy. I mean to be so morbid. You're alive. Something is ticking, even though you may have lost hope, may have been hurt. You're trying to find something. You're trying to find a, a glimmer, a light that can help you grow. 
So it's critical that whoever is working with you has to believe in you and has to believe in your potential, has to believe that. If not, where, where are you going to go from here? And that's somewhat of an aside. So to go back to the discussion here, that Pesach Sheni teaches us, second Passover, there's no farfal, there's nothing lost. Because there's a soul that always remains intact. So even though, using the expression from this, of the verses I mentioned earlier, even though this Tomei Lenefesh, that the soul has in some way become impure. One of the ways is when a person comes in contact with death, something happens to the soul of a human being. In a sense, death is like a disconnect. Disconnect between a body and a soul. So anyone that's in touch with death and is a sensitive human being, it will have an impact on you that is like a experiencing a mini-death. The grief, the psychological uh, dissonance, emotional and spiritual pain around death affects all those that are, are, uh, that are impacted by it. You know, this uh, coming um, Monday will be my father's sixth yard site. He passed away six years ago on the 20th of, of year. Okay. So, um, Tuesday actually, I should correct. And uh, even though the intensity of the loss and the intensity of the death and pain of it is not with me as it was six years ago, but it's not difficult for me to retrieve it because it's inside my memory, inside of my psyche. And at the time, it was extremely traumatic. Um, um, my father was 70 years old, so I'm not complaining in the sense that he didn't have, in a sense, I mean, 70 is young today, but nevertheless, every death is a death. Even when people lose their father or mother when they're 95, it's still a death, it's your parent. There's a certain finality to it. So I don't know if we can compare tragedies in a sense. Death is a tragedy. It's a cutoff. And there's much to be said about it. As much as you philosophize and pontificate, there's a cutoff. There's no way around that. And it affects not just the person who's passed on, but it more importantly affects those that remain on this earth. Because you have to ponder the issues of life and death. And you think about yourself, and you think about your children, and you think about all people, the permanence of things, the impermanence of things. I mean, there's plenty to talk about, and nobody should ever have to taste from it. But those of us that have, know it's a very serious thing and Judaism in a way honors it through Yisker. The holidays we say Yisker, we remember the souls of our parents. And through Kaddish and other ways. Not the point I want to discuss really, but I want to just say that's what I'm referring to. So when someone was contaminated so to speak, spiritually, polluted by death, they were unable to bring an offering into the temple. It's not a punishment. It's a state of being. When you're in that place, it's very difficult for you to focus on spiritual growth. I remember when I was sitting Shiva, it was a different zone. It's hard even to imagine. It was like hard to express. After seven days getting up, taking a walk in the street, which is a custom to do, I was in a sense completely, um, um, what the word for it? Uh, it was surreal, that's the word. Very surreal. Like, you know, all the things that mattered didn't matter anymore. And I remember saying to my sister, saying, so how long will this last, you know, this like sense of reality? And when we go back, when the curtain comes back down, we go back to our illusions, and they uh, matter as anything. You know? So it didn't take long, it takes a few days. But it's, and, and you know it at the time. So you have one second you have a moment of truth, you see something that's beyond, you realize how much, how much of our lives are petty, involved with things that are very temporary, very immediate, things that don't have any real significance down the road, down the line. And then the things of like, uh, you know, that, the legacies and the traditions and connections you have with your father and your mother. Um, you know, my f father goes back long before your memories, even uh, the, the genes, the influences, and so on. So that context was, is a very powerful one. And today, you know, as I said, I think back, I can talk about it. But when you experience it, there's no question. It puts you in a frame of mind that you're not really in a position to go bring offerings for Passover and doing other things like that, as, as special as they may be. Which is why a person who sits Shiva, and again, no one should know of it, and it was called an oval for, for a year, or an oinen before the burial, has is really um, absolved of many mitzvahs, many obligations. 
because not because uh, because it's as if you're in a place of uh, certain grief, certain place of uh, detachment from things and so on. Spiritually, we all have moments like that. It's those moments when you uh, feel lost, you feel like a zombie, or you feel like uh, aimless, not knowing where you're going, where your life is headed. Which brings me to the second expression. Even though the Jews who requested and said, Lama Nigara, why are we, uh, why are we, um, um, why are we deprived of bringing the offering? They talked about being impure, but when God commands it, He also says a second option: Bederchacheka. Those that will be in a distant, in a distant uh, literally means a distant road. Because spiritually speaking, there are two ways that a person can be um, disconnected. Two ways a soul can be lost. One is by experiencing something like I just said, a trauma. A trauma. And death was just one example. Trauma can be many ways. Anytime we experience some type of loss uh, and so on, that's one way that there's a certain sense of being lost. Uh, lack of grounding, and coordinates, and so on. And another is where you actually are in a place where you don't know where you are. You've wandered off and gotten lost, not due to an event, but simply due to your own journeys. You know, sometimes we begin on a journey and it's maybe a mistaken place to go to and then you end up stuck there. You can't get out. You know, this journey doesn't always mean physical. It could be uh, psychological. It could be spiritual. It can be relationship-oriented. Getting yourself in a bad relationship is a derech You've wandered away to a very distant place. And both these situations, whether it's an event of traumatic event, which causes this impurity that I mentioned, or it's choices you've made and uh, or circumstances that have led you away from where you should be, this all creates a sense of a loss. That's a lost soul. Now, as I said, all of us have moments like this. Some of us are more aware than others. Now, let's just clarify this further. The fact that you may feel that everything's going well in your life doesn't mean anything, to be very blunt. The reason why is because, look, if a person has a good job, making money, you can buy what you like, and you so to speak riding high, that creates a certain uh, called sugar coat effect that usually can distort and delude you into thinking everything is just great. Then suddenly you're struck, you're fired from a job, something happens, and you're left reeling because you're not prepared. So when exactly, what, what, how exactly do we find that, something, that your life is well, working well? Just because it looks like it's working well. Really working well means that no matter what happens to you, you'll be working well. Not just the circumstances at this moment are nice and good. So the Jewish way of looking at things, you don't just look at the symptoms, you look at the underlying forces. You, know, you can look at a building, beautiful building, structure and everything, and everyone thinks that maybe the most powerful building on the block or in the city and then, God forbid, a storm strikes or an earthquake, and that building is the one that f falls first. And other buildings that didn't look so good remain standing. So tell me, which building was the strongest building? In other words, we shouldn't be deceived, and this is often what we do, is we are consumed and we are controlled and affected very much by the here and now, by the world. As you know, we measure success, we measure uh, power, based on the immediate power. We don't necessarily base it on uh, um, perpetuation, on the future. If you were a historian and were able to go back into history and come back now to tell the story, and you were to predict, let's say, 3,000 years ago, which nation would, would be here today in the year 2011? So there's no question, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, the nations that were dominating then were the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, then the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. That's what everybody was. You, you, you would choose one of those that was the most powerful one at the time. Like most people think today, America. You know, China maybe is uh, rising. The fact of the matter is, all those empires fell. They have no descendants. All we have are ruins and uh, essentially tourist attractions like in museums, to see what, what uh, fragments remain from their great civilizations. And you have a small nation that was always the fewest among all, 
That's here. Only 14 million people. Back then it must have been a lot less. And we're here. So if you're a historian and went through everything, the Holocaust and before that the pogroms and before that the Inquisition and the Crusades and all the persecutions, no one ever would predict that. I'm just using it as an example. So for someone to say, I know what's most powerful, is both arrogant and presumptuous and idiotic, actually. Because we do not know what's most powerful. Even today, technology. What's the most powerful technology? So we know what's powerful today. We also know what was powerful 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Microsoft dominated. Then uh, today, Google dominates. So any intelligent person knows. We do not know what will be in 10 years from now because there's too many unpredictable variables. The point being is that intelligence, as opposed to uh, being seduced by the moment, teaches you, as I discussed last week at length, Ezu Chachem Hareya Sanaylet. Who's the wise person, the one that sees the birthing? Doesn't look at um, just the immediate symptom, the immediate cause, but looks at the long-term effects. What will this give birth to? And very wise people can see steps ahead, just like a chess, good chess player can see steps ahead. Can look at events, not be deceived by the moment, by the smoke screens, and is able to see a bigger picture. There aren't very many people that can do that well. Definitely not in a historical context. Some do it well in business and also not always successful. And few have real visionary ability. Vision, of course, to be able to see the big picture in the future, you have to also be a person who's a student of history and a student of the human condition in the past. Because most things have, in some way or another, played itself out. It's true there are new variables today, new characters, new countries, new players. But the scripts are very similar. You know, things like arrogance that brought down most empires is pretty universal, pretty timeless. But we sometimes think because we have so much technology, we think we're an advanced society. Again, how do you measure advanced? If you measure it by technology, yeah. If you measure it by standard of living, yes. By economic uh, prosperity, yes. But do you, what happens if you measure it by uh, the welfare of children in their homes? How healthy are relationships? Would you also say we're the most advanced society? So you see, it all comes down to what uh, tools we use to measure uh, health and to measure success. So to go back to what I was talking before about the lost soul idea, that um, the key thing in the blessed to be the blessed, most blessed thing in life is to have people who see you not for what you look like, but for your, what you are, for your essential uh, value, and that's not easy to find because we worship externals, youth, looks, money, everything that's that's temporary is worshipped. Permanent things are not worshipped in this world because we live in a transient world and it's much easier, especially in a te highly technological society, to uh, live in the moment. You know, you look at breaking news today, since it's like 24-7 news, everything is breaking news. There's no longer distinction, every stupid little detail. Um, so uh, when Michael Jackson died, you had them marching on every, uh, basically every plastic surgeon on, this, on earth giving their opinion about him. Because they have to fill the air, and we are voyeurists, voyeurism, looking and looking and, and, and worshiping the moment. That's how it is. You know, when you cut yourself off for a week from uh, your uh, iPhones and Androids and uh, Blackberries and newspapers and so on, and you survive, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting, you know, because we are plugged in, and plugged in means that we're very much controlled by other forces. Money, of course, sexuality are maybe the two dominant forces that drive most people's lives. And, of course, the misery and anxiety that comes always together with it. So there you got the picture of the human condition. And that has not changed throughout history. So when discussing here the idea of, uh, as I was saying, Pesach Sheni, that there is nothing, that there's no farfalon, that... Uh, there's always, a, there's always hope, there's always a second chance. It's really looking at the universe and looking at ourselves in a deeper way. As I mentioned before with the therapy, if you don't believe that the soul and the regenerative powers of the soul, that we have powers that we cannot see 
and therefore no human being on earth is a damaged goods, no matter how hurt they've been, then you understand the power of uh, the big picture. But to believe that is difficult because we live in a world that does not believe in us, and therefore we don't end up believing in ourselves. We live in a world, the blind leading the blind. So it's very appropriate to uh, have a day like this, Pesach Sheni. As I explained, the spiritual meaning of the two types of um, wandering off, one is a person who's been experienced a trauma, the grief of death or of other loss, and the second is a person who's wandered away from who they really are. You know, wandered away from who they really are. And remember, the conditioning that we grow up with is a very big factor in this case. <coughs> the Baal Shem Tov um, says, I ask the question, says, um, we say every day in the prayer, Elekeinu velekeya vesenu, our God and the God of our parents. And he asks the question, the order should be reversed. First is the God of our parents, then it's our God. First our parents were around, then we come. And his answer is both uh, simple and, and profound. Very profound, especially in practical terms. His answer is that the objective of relationship with God is that it be your God. It begins chronologically, yes, you are, whether you like it or not, a child of your parents, and the schools they sent you to, and the programming that they programmed you with and based on their attitudes, for good or for bad, shape you. But there comes a point in your life when you grow into an adult where you're expected to not just have, to begin with Elikeinu, not Elikeinu, that That's not just the God of our parents. I submit here, based on my own limited experience, that many, many people who are committed to tradition and Judaism and so on are perhaps worshiping the God of their parents or great-grandparents or great-great-ancestors. To make it yours and own it is a whole different story. So to grow up in something, no matter how devout and pious and connected you are, and no matter how virtuous even, if it's based on a program that was given to you, it's still not yours. You have not owned it. Now it has its consequences, even though some people can get away with being conformists of that nature. But that's not a person who's found themselves. That's a person who is uh, playing out the script that someone else wrote. And even if it looks like a good script, God himself says that he despises mitzvah sanoshim alamada. In Yeshaya, the prophet, there's a whole chapter where he talks about this, how God says he despises people who just do things by rote, mechanically, without a heart, without their heart. And he goes on to a whole thing of how you can just do things by lip service, mechanically, by rote, robotic, and uh, that's not necessarily a relationship. That's a machine. So being lost soul does, is really something that's a universal and applies to every human being on earth because we're shaped by so many forces that it's very difficult to know even who you really are. Someone asks you, who, so who am I? Most people, when you ask them that question, give you their business card. Now, your business card is what you do, not who you are. Now, some of us, very few, but some, perhaps their work, their jobs, reflect what you are. And you have a job that you love, and it's in a full expression of what your soul wants. Or some of us deceive ourselves into thinking that, because you do the best with what you have, you know. <clears throat> Statistics show most people don't like the work they do. Except if the reward is good enough, the compensation is good enough, it, uh, it buys their uh, love so to speak, because you're getting something for it, so you, it's a give and take. It's like uh, I give my life to something I don't necessarily like, but I'm getting in return something that gives me power or gives me the ability to buy whatever I want. So the question of who a person really is is not at all a simple matter, because it really comes down to understanding what a soul is like. When you say who you really are, you're not talking about the body, because, it's, uh, God forbid, after death, you have a corpse. So you could, uh, a pathologist can dissect the body and figure out all the body parts and still not know who you are. Personality, the psyche and soul of a human being has a whole personality. That cannot be put under a microscope. You can't see it under any, under any instrument. But there are people who are soul experts, soul doctors who can see a soul. Those are people who are connected to their own soul, obviously. 
You can't see something you don't have yourself. And the soul, just like the body, and more than the body, has its own uh, rules and it has its own systems. So just like a body has, as we know, hundreds of systems, 75 trillion, not billion, but trillion cells. It's the only thing that's higher than the United States deficit, the, trillion, the cells in the human body. 75 trillion cells. And every cell is necessary. It's not even, it's, not, it's unfathomable even. We don't even know the number 75 trillion is impossible to even imagine. But it's there. And we have hundreds and thousands of systems that work simultaneously right now inside your body. There's the circulatory system, the neurological, the nervous system, you know, the work, the muscular, the skeletal. And each one breaks down further and so on. I mean, it's an awesome uh, exercise to just look at not just how each system functions, but how they all coordinate with each other, which is even more impossible to imagine. But it does. And understanding that, of course, helps us understand who we, how we function, what health is about. And God forbid if a person is not healthy in any way, the more we understand those internal sciences, the things that make us tick, the better we can heal. But what about the soul? Has anyone ever did an equivalent study of the soul? How many cells are there in the soul? So not necessarily physical cells, but how many components, how many pieces? Well, this is, in essence, what uh, true Torah is about. Now, some people call it Kabbalah, and some people call it Chassidus, and some people call it Pnimi Satara. But the truth is, it is the essence of the entire Torah. And just to explain, in case some of you may wonder how I could say that, because most people would say Torah is a body of laws. You know, I have right here a chumash in front of me. It has five books. And most of it is, uh, I mean, not all laws, but it was 613 mitzvahs, 248 positive, 365 negative. And the rest are the narrative, the biblical narrative from, an ad from the beginning of creation, Genesis through Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, through all those generations. Basically, 26 generations are covered in the entire Bible. From Adam to Noah is 10 generations. From Noah to Abraham is another 10. From Abraham to Moses is seven, six, seven generations. And the end of the Torah is with Moses passing after the 40 years traveling in the wilderness. That's the story. And anyone learning it saying that's the Torah. So we also know there's a Tanakh where the story continues with the Jews entering the Promised Land and Joshua and then the rest of the books and the kings and the prophets and the, and the Skanim and so on. And then comes, of course, the body of oral Torah. But if someone asks in one sentence, what is the Torah? Very hard question to answer. A real scholar who studied the Torah all their lives, I know I went to yeshiva, so many would say the Torah is a body of law, how God wants us to live. Laws to do this, laws that touch uh, law between man and man, between man and God, they know them the chaveri, they know them the you know. Is that really the definition of the Torah? Well, the question, the answer is obvious because it's in the word Torah itself. What does the word Torah mean? Torah comes from the word hira, a direction, a guide. It's a book of a, a, a guide, a directive. That's the word Torah. Torah also is equated with the word light, Torah or. The Aramaic for Torah is Eraisa. In the Zohar, the author of which is like Ba'imur Rajbi, coming Sunday, says Eraisa comes from the word Eir Yaisa, the transmission of light. In Aramaic, Eir is light, in Hebrew as well. Yaisa in Aramaic means the transmission, to draw light. So here we go. Torah is direction, guide, light, drawing light. That's the actual definition, without any uh, um, deeper interpretations. But here comes the biggest question of all. The Torah formally was given at Sinai, 26 generations after Genesis, after the creation. And yet we learn, in the Talmud it says that the, the patriarchs all studied Torah, all performed the Torah. But out of most of the Torah are all mitzvahs and events that are primarily took place after the Jews left Egypt. So how exactly did the patriarchs and matriarchs 
uh, fulfill all these mitzvahs that are all connected with uh, leaving Egypt. For example, mezuzah, tefillin. I'm talking about Passover and the Seder. Everything connected to Passover. It's tzitzis. I mean, there's so many things that are all connected to events that happen later. So what, where, what, what is this Torah exactly that existed before it was given at Sinai? Was it also a body of laws? More importantly, when you look deeper into the story, you read that the Torah is the blueprint by which God created the universe. This Medrus says that, that an architect first looks into a blueprint, first creates a blueprint, and then follows the blueprint to create a structure. And the same thing is an analogy for God creating the universe. Then you have the Zohar that says, Estakel Baraisa or Bara Alman, that God looked into the Torah and created the universe. Which means the Torah preceded the universe. As it also says in the Medrash, Al Payim Shana Kodma the Torah precedes existence. So if the Torah is just this body of laws and these stories that all take place later, after existence, what was, what was inside the blueprint that God looked at before everything came into being? This is the blueprint that created existence. So what did he look into the Torah and says, oh, there's a Garden of Eden and therefore I'll put a Garden of Eden? There was no Garden of Eden before. So this is where you must, there's no choice, but you have to go into the writings of the Zohar and the writings of the Arizal, Kisra Arizal, who, by the way, didn't write most of his writings. His student did, Chaim Vital, but it's still called Kisra Arizal. And you have to look into the inner dimension of Torah to understand this, because this is all about the inner dimension of Torah. And what they explain is that the Torah is really, in one expression, is the divine mind at work. It's God's vision of existence. It doesn't begin in the Garden of Eden or in Egypt, or in the, in the valleys of Mesopotamia, it begins with God, that the creator, the composer, the cosmic engineer, had a plan. And that plan is the Torah. It's one with him. So when you think of it like an architect or a composer of music, before even putting anything down on paper or creating anything, there's what the composer has, what does he envision? And that envision is each of us right here. And all that is really the essence of Torah, the blueprint by which existence comes into being. So actually it's the exact opposite. It's not that it starts with laws and narratives. It starts with God's vision. And that vision translates into laws and narratives. That's really the definition of Torah. So in its real pure, pristine sense, the Torah is a spiritual entity. Just as God is beyond us all, the Torah too is beyond. And then the Torah began to so-called evolve into a language that we can relate to. Dibra Torah B'loshem B'nei Adam speaks in our language. And in events that play out the vision that God wanted to play out. So if you really want to think of it this way, then the Torah is essentially the equivalent, Lahavdul if you want, of a fundamental medical manual that gives you the biology and chemistry and the DNA of the human body, the Torah will give you the DNA of the soul and of the cosmos and of all of existence. So when someone really studies Torah properly, they're really seeing the building blocks of existence. When you hear it that way, you can begin to start thinking about Elekeinu, that it's your God, not just the God of your parents. You see, little children follow the rules and they follow what their parents tell them to do and they go to the schools and they are indoctrinated in a certain system. It could be a beautiful system with all the mitzvahs and the laws. But what I said earlier, to become Elikeinu, your God, that's a whole different story. That's like a new life. That's after you were given everything on a platter in your education and by your parents, and I'm saying even the healthiest parents. Now starts a new journey, your journey. Elikeinu, what is your relationship with all of this? And that's why the story of Pesach Sheni is so relevant because all of us are either Tomei Lenefesh or Derech Recheka, the two expressions. We've either been contaminated by life and life's experiences or we just wandered and lost. And the fact that most of us won't acknowledge it doesn't mean anything. Most people who are lost don't know they're lost. You think you find somebody wandering somewhere and they've gotten accustomed and they've adjusted 
the day they lost. No, they'll say this is where I always was and always I belong. One of the reasons we learn about what's called Yeridah Sanashama Baguf, how a soul enters down to this world, and you study where the soul comes from, is to teach you the first thing and of above all that you're a stranger on this earth. The soul does not feel comfortable in the material world. And if you get too comfortable, it means there's some problem. Now the point is not to live an uncomfortable life. The point is to live a life that has a, a paradox. There's a dual, two forces at work. There's a restlessness that's always looking to go somewhere beyond. And then there's the realities on the ground. But we've adjusted and we've become accustomed. This is, most people have built their homes here. And we think this is the permanent place. The interesting thing in Jewish uh, faith, this will be the permanent place. It's not like we wait to come to the world to come and that's where it, the show starts. It will be here. But it will be here with an understanding that this place itself becomes a spiritual environment. So we live in a world, as uh, the, the thinkers say, most people think we're... Um, we're on a physical journey having a spiritual experience. When in truth, we're on a spiritual journey having a physical experience. But ask yourself, which one do you really feel? Most of us feel the physical journey. From time to time, we have a spiritual experience. You know, we hear a song, we sing, the holiday comes, moments, simchas, weddings, celebrations, sometimes sad moments, and so on. We have a break from reality. This is reality. So the first challenge is to come to realize, to, to, to weaken the hold of this so-called false reality on you and your consciousness. Now some people, it comes easy. Some people naturally know and sense that this is not where it's at. Many don't. And it's very hard even to, come, to explain, to, how could you explain colors to a blind person? Can you explain music to a deaf person? And that's not coming from an arrogant place, it's just, it's a different reality. Some people are deeply materialistic. That, what is tangible and concrete, that's the only thing they relate to. Everything else is fantasy. You know, maybe nice ideas, and you know, maybe that's, those are the people you can take advantage of because they're like not in touch with reality down here, you know. The creative uh, dreamers, the Luft people, they call them. What do you say, Luft? The uh, airy people. People who float, floaters. So, here we have this chapter where the people come to Moses and Aaron and they complain, they say, why are we deprived? Just because we got lost or just because we experienced grief or we, death and we became impure, why are we deprived? Why can we not connect? Just because we're lost souls, can we not do anything about it? And Moses didn't know what to answer because as I said before, he did not have a precedent. All the mitzvahs you cannot replace. You know, once the, the over zmane, bottle karbone, the day passes, you can't pray tomorrow for today. Every day has its uh, energy, has its bitter, has its refinement. Like the Zohar says, chasu yeme, chasu If you're missing a day, you're missing a garment. So there's certain mitzvahs that are time sensitive that can't be replaced. So Moses didn't know what to do, but on the other hand, he saw the heartfelt cry of Lama Negara, why they felt lost, they felt missing something. So he turned to God and he knew that the power of prayer does things and God said, here, I'll give you a new mitzvah. One time, you'll have the ability that's in Shtokim Fafal to show you that you can, um, you can experience something even if you missed it at the time. In other words, even if you lost your way, you have an ability to return. Of course, that comes with work. But above all, it came because they cried out. You know, they tell the story of one of the rebbes that um, a chassid of his had a prick problem. He came to him, he cried out his heart. And the rebbe told him, I can't help you. <clears throat> well, you know, as much as he tried and as much as he demanded and uh, to, to no avail, so he leaves the room in absolutely shattered. He thought this was his last hope. And he meets the brother, the older brother of this Rebbe. And the older brother says, what's, what's the matter? Why are you so disturbed? He says, I went to the Rebbe, your brother. And that was my last hope. I thought a Rebbe is a Rebbe. He can open up new doors, give me some hope. And uh, instead he told me he can't help me. So his brother, hearing this, the older brother, walks into his brother, the, the Rebbe, and says to him, 
you know, you're giving the powers to be a Rebbe, not to uh, break people's hearts, but to help them. So the Rebbe said to him, send them back in here. When he came back in, he, was, he helped them. Later, he explained to his brother that he came in here thinking, I'm going to solve his problems, which meant it wasn't about him. He wanted my, my intervention. And he did not have the enough eye sense. He did not have enough in him the motivation to really, because I can give him blessings, but then he'd have to uh, maintain them. And since one thing is to help somebody, one other is to, to be maintained in your life. Someone can lift you up, but the question is, once they're gone, will you still be able to stand on your own feet? So that's what he sensed. So everything is a two-way street. Um, in Judaism, there's no such thing as magic pills and magic tricks. Yes, there were miracles, and there were times where God is merciful and can be grace and with grace give somebody something, even though they may not have asked for it or not deserved it. But that's something we don't rely on or depend on. The key thing is to know because they cried out and a sincere, heartfelt cry. That Lama Negara, that's what did it. So the first step in any type of uh, healing, the first step in any type of growth or healing is to cry out. Which means, as a Yediyah Samachla Chetzi Rufua, awareness of an illness is half the cure. And uh, like the famous the analogy you always give is with the doctor, if someone had a stroke, God forbid, and they were, their nerves were severed and could not feel anything. And after months and months and months of being numb, one day the doctor pinches or, or pricks the, the patient and he yells out, and the doctor, of course, is ecstatic. And he says, why are you, why are you so happy about it? I'm in pain. He says, well, because I was doing this for five months and then now you didn't feel anything. So the sensation of pain, even though we're great at painkillers, and we love to get rid of temporary pain. But imagine you had no pain in your life. If we had no nerves and we didn't feel anything, you'd be able to, God forbid, bite off your tongue and, uh, and experience other tragic things. Pain is really a, uh, basically a warning signal that there's something wrong. It's a gift. It's a gift if there's something wrong, obviously. Because it's warning you do something about it. Obviously, there are uh, shallow, superficial pain. You can get rid of it without digging deep or great. But some pain is a real warning. The same is true with psychological pain. If a person feels, uh, at times you feel, certain sadness. Other times people burst out crying for no apparent reason. Those are sensitive souls. Or you sometimes remember something or hear a song. It reminds you, it connects you to something. Those moments of sensitivity and sensation are the healthiest things in a human being's life. They say uh, tears bathe the soul. It's like a bath for the soul. Again, we live in a society that uh, doesn't uh, worship tears. Men don't cry, they tell us. Uh, women who are fickle and weak, that's the perception. But tears is a sign of a person who is healthy. The, Balsha, the Rizal says, but he says, a person who doesn't cry in the 10 days of tshuva, ein nishmose shlema, his soul is not complete. Because it's a sign of sensitivity. A person who is able to recognize that this reality is not where it's at, and there's something greater and higher, that's a person who cries at times. We're not talking about tears of grief and not tears of weakness. You're talking about tears of awareness. Awareness. A type of awareness of something beyond us all. Like a sense of awe. So the first thing for any person to grow is a type of awareness. If you don't have that, you're not going very far. Because you're content. And when a person is content, they, it leads to apathy. The more content you are, the more apathetic you become. It's a formula. It's a rule. Um, and it's a rule even in the material world. People who are become happy and with their, with their lot and just remain there usually start stagnating. It's competition, pressure, being challenged. And sometimes, yes, something loss that motivates people. But we don't need to experience it necessarily in a negative way. In this case, it was, two, it was these people who just simply sensed 
that they were distant. They sensed that they missed an opportunity. And they didn't want to go away um, uh, in, um, deprived. And they demanded and they prevailed. So there's a story in the Zohar. This was Sunday's Lag Bomer. <coughs> Lag Bomer is the day of the yard site of the Rav Shimon Bayechoy. Rav Shimon Bayechoy is the author of the Zohar. The Zohar is the classic text of Kabbalah. And it's a cryptic book. Much of it is hard to understand or almost impossible. There are a lot of stories there, and there are things that are pretty understandable. And primarily, there are a lot of things there that are not understandable then, but over the years, with explanations of later sages, we have an understanding of many ideas in the Zohar. Today, Zohar is not necessarily something you go to learn. You learn it through the commentaries. You learn it through the through Hasidus. You learn it through books that explain it in in ways that we can relate to. But it is, the, in a way, the Bible of Kabbalah. It is the original book. It was authored, by, as I said, by Rav Shem and by Yechoi, despite some of the, some, some, some Gershon Shalom and other people's theories. It was discovered in caves in the 15th century in cities around Italy, Manitoba and uh, Cremona, different versions. And at the time, no one understood what they were until a few sages were seen, saw these manuscripts, and they immediately recognized it because it was passed on orally, generation to generation, and quoted even in certain books, but only, only fragments of it. And then it was published then. <laughs> I'm going to go through a whole history of the Zohar, but the Zohar, at the end of the Zohar, there's a whole description. It's called the Idra Zuta, which means the small um, group small cave, small, and it talks about the passing of Rosh Hashim Bayechoy, his last days. And there he actually instructs his student, Rab Abba, to write down the Zohar. So the actual writing of the Zohar was his student, Rab Abba, but it was all dictated and all part of Rosh Hashim Bayechoy's teachings. There are books today in English that really describe, break down the Zohar. There are sections of the Zohar actually are attributed to Moshe Rabbeinu. There are sections called Raya Mehemna, which means faithful shepherd. These are sections that Moshe Rabbeinu, in his time, Moses taught the Kabbalah in his time. Kabbalah is the inner Torah, which means it's not some revelation that came later. It was given at Sinai. As a matter of fact, Sinai probably was more of a Kabbalistic experience than a Talmudic one. You know, they saw the sounds. They heard the sights. There was a vision. You know, what was going on at Sinai? It was definitely a mystical experience, which we don't fully comprehend. So if anything, they probably had more exposure to the so-called inner Torah than the outer then. And as I said earlier, it is the inner Torah that's the essence of the Torah, stripped before it manifests in the narrative and the story and the episodes. So in the Zohar, there are many, as I said, stories. One of them is, uh, <coughs> well, two I want to mention. One is not really a story, it's an expression. Right in the beginning of the Zohar, there's an expression called, that in the beginning of it all, there was a dark lamp, a lamp of darkness. And obviously, the, the term lamp of darkness immediately conjures up, it's a, a contradiction of terms. A lamp is not dark. A lamp gives off light. And at the time, however they understood, they understood it, but years later, centuries later, the Arizal <coughs> um, also opens his classic book called It's Chaim, Tree of Life, with a similar expression, not called the lamp, he calls it the tzimtzum. That in the beginning of it all there was light, and then God concealed it all, and it became dark, like a black hole. And when you look at the beginning of the Torah, the Bible, you also find the same expression. After the first verse, in the beginning God created heaven and earth, it says, It says the earth was, was, uh, was uh, chaotic, confused, and there was darkness over all of existence. And then the, the Spirit of God, Ruach HaLikim HaRachef Asal Pnei Now this is a verse in the Torah, it's the second verse. Now if you tell me this is a uh, halachic uh, uh, verse, this is pure mysticism. However, it's not so mystical as it sounds in a way, you know, because what, what does that mean? What kind of darkness? What toihu, voihu? 
So you need Kabbalah to explain the simple first verses of the Torah. And even when you go on, you talk about the creation of human being. It says that God instilled in a human being the image of God. But what's the, what's the, what is the image of God exactly? We're told that God has no image. And suddenly Tzalem a human being, is an image of God. As one of the philosophers once asked, where's the only place in the Torah that God transgresses his uh, second commandment? Not to create any, the, anything in the graven image of God. God himself created something in the image of God. That's the human being. So the first verses in the, the, first verses in the Bible, in the Torah, the first opening of Zohar, the opening of Eitz Chaim, all begin with this concept of a darkness. So there's a story later in the Zohar that Rashbi and his son Rabbi Lozer, who for, 10 years, for 12 years had to hide in a cave because the Romans were out to kill him for studying Torah in public, which was considered a crime. So in those dark times of the Roman times, Rashbi and the Rabbi Lozer were once, during those 12 years, once in the morning, once in the, they were studying Torah all night, and the night is dark, of course, and it came early morning. If you ever stay up and you see the dawn break, it's an interesting phenomenon. And Rashbi said to Rabbi Lazar when he looked at the dawn breaking, he said, what do you see? And he said, you know, you see, you start seeing, first the sky gets a little light in the horizon. Then you start seeing one glimmer, another glimmer, another peak, another peak. And slowly the dawn begins to break. The dawn begins to break, and then the sun begins to rise. So Rajbi says to Rabbi Lazar, life in our times is dark. Life is dark in all times. But how will the redemption come? Personal redemption and global redemption, it will come like the dawn breaks. Kayelas hashachar. It doesn't come in a moment. It comes through glimpses. First, here's a glimmer. There's a glimmer. And uh, you can think that nothing's happening. So in the dawn, it takes just a few minutes or maybe a few, uh, half hour or an hour until you see it emerge. But in our lives, it may take a little more. But those glimmers are the key thing because they are the sign that something is emerging, something is happening. That's what he told him, which is, of course, a lesson to us all in life about the lamp of darkness, that it's dark, but there's a lamp in there somewhere. Uh, what do they say? Uh, Ronald Reagan, they called him the eternal optimist that uh, like the little farm boy that opens up a barn, the barn is covered with manure from the floor, from the floor to the ceiling. So most of us would uh, you know, say something negative. Um, and the little farm boy says, oh, there must be a pony in here somewhere. You know, Sometimes very intense darkness tells you that there's something maybe in there too. And not to be deceived by how uh, dark it looks. So that's what Rashbi told uh, Rabbi Lazar, which is essentially... Uh, in the so-called, in the process of, of any growth or healing, it's the nece necessity is to have something to hold on to, some type of uh, glimpse, some type of glimmer. He said, that's how it will all, all rise. The expression actually, Alois HaShachar, those of you who may know Hebrew, Alois HaShachar, the Zohar asks this, seems like a strange expression. Alois HaShachar means the rising of what? It should have said Alois HaShemesh, the sun rises. Shachar is darkness. Shachrus comes from the word shachar, from dark. So what does it mean, the rising of the darkness? It's the exact opposite. So the Zohar answers, Alesa shachar means that the darkness lifts. Not really the rising of the dawn. Alesa shachar means the lifting of the darkness. And the lifting of the darkness in face of the light that emerges. And you know, a little light can dispel much darkness. I mean, you have this story plays itself out also when Jacob fights with the angel. The same thing it says that they fought all night. At night, you're at war because night is dark. It's confusing. That's the time when the criminals and the, they said the the unwanted forces emerge. And uh, when the dawn started breaking, the angel recognized that time he can no longer stay here. So there too is used Alei Shashacha. The Ramban says that uh, the war between Jacob and the angel, the wrestle between the two, well, the Tsar says that it happened in Kippur night, actually. 
And as the Ramban says, this reflects the war that all of us fight throughout history with our enemies. Every form of oppression is, plays out that battle that night. And obviously, that also includes all our internal battles. So we have a world that is completely surrounded in darkness. To the point, as the Baal Shem Tov says, Haster, Aster, Panai, and Esther, a double darkness. Haster, Aster, it's so dark that the darkness conceals that it's dark, that, uh, to the point that you think that Mar uh, Lamosik, you think that bitterness is sweet and sweetness is bitter. That's how dark it can become. So we're here to wake each other up, in a way. Um, and uh, there are experiences in life where you'll, we'll have wake-up calls. And those are the great blessings. It's the moments when you feel the dissonance, and you feel the pain, and that you feel there's something wrong. The Loma Negara, when you feel deprivation of something, that's when there's a, a real opening. Unfortunately, most of us misunderstand those moments, and we either try to push them away because it's uncomfortable, We'd rather go back to a comfortable past than an uncomfortable uh, future. Or we misunderstand the meaning of it and we think uh, something's wrong with us. The truth is that's awareness. It's not comfortable, but it is real. And that reality is what opens the door to, to, to great strengths. You know, as I said before, each of our souls has unbelievable potential. And unfortunately, most of that potential is trapped in our uh, conventions, in our routines, in our daily lives, in, the, in our um, upbringing programs, and uh, most importantly, uh, maybe the things that people expect from us. You know, we're creatures of habit and also creatures of uh, uh, social animals, which means we're dependent on other people's approval. Even people call themselves independent you know, I don't know what independent means, how independent independent is, but everyone needs peer approval. You know, even independent people make sure that independence is also approved. So you're approved to be an independent, so to speak. Um, uh, an Abraham, Echad Hayav Ram, who actually rebelled against the whole world, including his family, including his whole society, a complete nonconformist. I don't know if we could really find a person like that on earth today. Because we all have our comfort zones. And uh, sometimes our comfort zones are very, very comfortable. And they keep us uh, trapped. So, and I think to myself coming here, this class tonight, <laughs> I've been doing this almost, uh, I don't know, I don't even want to say how many years. Was it 30 years? Going on 30. And uh, uh, you know, I well, sometimes wonder whether this is more for me or for, or for you. I think... Um, in a world like we live in, the idea of uh, making happy people miserable and miserable people happy is an interesting uh, experiment. What I mean by that is that um, comfort zones don't bring out the best in anybody. And I've discovered in my own personal life that pressure is uh, critical. And it's always best to put the pressure on yourself before someone else puts it on you and lock yourself into certain situations. You know, I have, I have no doubt, based on uh, my experience and my understanding, you know, we live in a world today of a lot of upheaval. Many people are very frightened because it doesn't take much for this world to explode now. There's so many ingredients. It's like a combustion chamber. Here in the Middle East, dissent, anger. I mean, Israel is, uh, is now beginning to feel it uh, more than ever. So there's a lot to be pessimistic about and uh, very frightening, frightening and fatalistic and even apocalyptic. I mean, what do you need? Just you need a country like Egypt or other countries. Somebody uh, is going to get control of a certain uh, arsenal, press a few buttons. You can create a lot of damage. I know it's hard to imagine. We don't even want to think about it. So there's a whole scenario that is very, very uh, negative, uh, apocalyptic scenario. Nevertheless, nevertheless, this is where it comes down to people of vision that have uh, given us some vision from the past that see a bigger picture. A bigger picture doesn't mean that we won't have moments of, of relapse and pain and setbacks, but the bigger picture is exactly as Rajbi told it to his son, that light emerges, and it emerges step by step. If you're wise, you can uh, expedite the process. If not, sometimes it draws on and on and on. 
But you see, in our case, it's easier to relate to and believe because the past is a lesson. Who was right? Were the Romans survived or did the Rajbi and his son survive? So you have uh, real lessons, and not once, not, one, not twice. And if you really want to go back to Abraham himself, Avram Avinu, and God, the Brisbane Absarim, the covenant that God made with Abraham, which is like the basis of the whole relationship between God and the Jewish people. So read the verses in the Lech Lecha, which are also very cryptic and mystical, where it talks about that, that uh, Abraham fell into a trance, and he sensed a deep dread and darkness overcame him. And that's when God says to him that your children and grandchildren will, live, will be for 400 years in a land that's not theirs as strangers. And then they will come out with great wealth. And all the Midrashim and all the commentaries explained those words. What was the dread? What was the darkness? And they said each verse there, each word, Ema, Cheshecha, Charei, Degdela, and all that, all refer to the empires to come. The, Babylon, the Egyptian Empire, of course, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the, the Greek Empire, and finally, the final empires. The Barbanel says it includes um, the Roman Empire, which destroyed the Second Temple, and we are still in that, under that control. Not Roman, but the Western Christian world. And the second would be the empire, the Yishmaelat Empire, the Muslim Empire, the Ottoman Empire. All brought a great dread over a man called Avram Avinu. But he wasn't frightened, and he taught his children this vision, and they passed it on, and that's why they were able to survive it all. The night of Pesach, we say, that even though in each generation there will be those that try to destroy us, Vihi, what's Vihi Shamdalamdalam? It says it in a cryptic, uh, 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 vague term, he. He means she. She will withstand. She will prevail over everything. So what's the he? Could have just said. So there are two interpretations. Some say faith, our faith. Some say the promise. It's really both. It's faith and the promise. The promise that God gave Abraham. The promise that Abraham passed on generation to generation. The faith that they had. He, that prevails over everything, even the Holocaust and even all the tragedies before that. And it's said in the Vihi, Kabbalah says Vihi is Malchus, it's the dignity and the faith of a human being. Malchus less lamagamoklum, it has no power and light of its own. It's like the moon. The moon only reflects the sun, but the power of Malchus is greater than the power of the sun. The moon has its own power that uh, the sun will never have. It's the power that comes from the lamp of darkness. It's the power that comes from the light that comes at night. And you see the moon has its own haunting power. It has its own romantic energy. Even though it's just a reflection, but it's not a reflection like a mirror reflection. It, uh, the moon has its own power. As they say that uh, people in love don't stare at the sun. They look at the moon. And uh, the moonlight is what Jews are compared to Israel, Daimim Lulavana, Mainim Lulavana, because just as the moon goes through its cycles, and, it's, uh, and, it, and, and it goes through its, um, uh, it waxes and wanes, and is about to die, it just reborn again, the new moon, Rosh Chedesh, so too the Jewish people. The, the nations of the world are compared to the sun, a certain steady light, but you don't have renewal. And again, the Talmud says, compares David who are cotton and Yaakov who are cotton, it compares the greats all to the moon. Because the moon in its so-called, um, uh, in its humility, its power is much greater than the sun's power. The sun knows how to give, but doesn't know how to take, doesn't know how to receive. I, I say receive, not take. I don't mean like uh, being a schnorrer that knows how to take. I meant knows how to absorb. This moon knows how to absorb. And that power, called in Hasidic terminology, Eir refractive energy, as opposed to Eir Yosha, which is direct light, is more powerful than, uh, than anything. It's the power that comes from the Tamid Yesim when a teacher teaches. So the Talmud says, where do you learn most from? He says, I learn much from my teachers, I learn more from my friends, colleagues, and I learn most, the Tamid Yesim I learn most from my students. How could a teacher, a great teacher, learn most from the students? His teachers are greater than him. His colleagues are equal to him. 
Because there's something that happens when you reach inward, outward, you have to go much deeper inward. And that's what the moon is able to reach. So we have a mission in this world. We've sent our soul, was sent precisely to be lost in this world. But it's not completely lost. It has uh, signals. It has its own um, internal GPS system, let's put it that way, that allows it to retrace the steps. You have a sense of things. God blessed us with music, with song. He blessed us with many things that remind us of something greater than our here and now. The key thing is to, not, is to be wise and not be seduced and deceived by the temporary elements of superficial world. To recognize that there's something beneath the surface and it's waiting to emerge. And on a very basic level, it's about us, you and I. You, each of us has enormous potential. Are you fulfilling your mission in this world? Why were you sent here? You know, the, the clock ticks, we get older, and uh, you can't turn the clock back. It's true, there's no far found. You could always repair things. There's still the, the clock still ticks. So the real question is what we can do for each other to help actualize our general, in general our potential and particularly our calling. That's what it comes down to. To me, that's what I discovered. You know, I went to yeshiva system and I learned the Torah that anyone who goes to yeshiva learns. But when I discovered my God, not just the God of my parents, it was understanding that. That's what it comes down to. That you have an indispensable mission to fulfill. Every one of us here, every one of us. And what you have to accomplish, no one else can accomplish but you. And the sad part is most of us have no clue. First of all, that we have the mission, let alone what the mission is itself. And I don't say that in a critical way. It's just reality. We, by the time, this should have been taught to us in yeshiva when we were not busy making a living and we had the time to explore. By the time you start thinking like an adult, you're already overwhelmed by responsibilities. You have a family, you have parnasa to make, other, other stuff. You know, they taught, if, uh, I, was, uh, I heard this uh, TED conference, uh, one of those talks by, um, who was it? Some uh, educator from England. Brilliant talk. A very short talk like these. They're all 18-minute talks. So he's talking about education, the education system. And essentially what he says is that, um, you know, where does our modern Western education system come from? And he says it was established essentially by Napoleon and Fred, Fred, Ferdinand, Fred, uh, the, the Great. Frederick the Great. What? Ferdinand. Ferdinand or Frederick the Great from Austria. Prussia. The Emperor of Prussia. Now, what the, how did they establish the education system, which is effect still today? They call it elementary school because elementary is training for uh, army. So they, trained, they, they created a curriculum that would train children to become soldiers, basically. And then uh, Napoleon added the, uh, Fred, uh, added the element of economic success, money and war, basically. And they essentially made the primary uh, curriculum is around, if you look, well, everything that's utilitarian, mathematics, um, uh, history, social studies, um, science, and stuff like that. The arts, music, song, dance, all is relegated to so-called special education, you know, like extracurricular activities. And he makes the case that children naturally are uh, singers and dancers and musical. And what happens is school cuts all that out, makes it, devalues it, and basically trains them to become accountants and lawyers and doctors and soldiers um, in a certain way. Very tangible, practical, concrete things. I mean, it's a very interesting talk that he gives and how it uh, how essentially goes against the grain of the natural human being. Now, that, means that, not, that doesn't mean every one of us is a musician, but it means we relate to the more ethereal things. And education has nothing to do with ethereal elements, nothing subtle about it. It's all about utility, function, success, making money, um, efficiency in the, in the, on, the, on the battlefield. So today may not be battles in the physical sense, but it's the same type of tangible stuff. So I was thinking how that impacted the yeshiva system, you know, what's going on in our, in our uh, internal yeshiva system. So, we, so in a way, very many ways, it's very parallel. The main focus in the yeshiva system is learning law, learning the Torah law. You know, you begin, yes, as a young child, you learn Alaves, ABC, then you learn Chumash, and basically biblical commentary, 
And most of it is taught as a, some thing that happened thousands of years ago. You just master that. The commentaries, how they argue about it. Then you start learning Mishnah and Gemara and so on, all about basically le- the legalities of Judaism, the mechanics of Judaism. It's all important. Very little focus on the ethereal. You're not taught about God. You're not taught about your soul. You're not taught about your purpose in this world. So essentially you're taught about a whole bunch of mechanics that are all necessary. It's like you're taught about the tool chest, but you're not taught about what you're supposed to do with this tool chest, except follow the laws. And in a way, that's like the difference between the outer Torah and the inner Torah. So as we stand here today, Pesach Sheni comes right four days before Lag Bomer. This is the 15th of the year. This is the 18th of the year. Maybe it's a good opportunity the Rebbe, one of the Rebbe's Rashab, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe says that Lag Bomer is the Matan Terah of Primis Atar. You know, at Sinai we were giving mostly the outer Torah, even though, as I said before, it was an mystical experience. But on outer level we were given the, and at Lag Bomer he says was like the revelation of the inner Torah, of Shimon Bayechai. Without it, the Torah is rendered into basically, as I said, mechanical, a toolbox. All necessary, all necessary to function, but, but, but lacking the soul and lacking its purpose. So that's, in a way, a challenge of our times, is how do you uh, communicate that? How do you communicate it both to people who grew up in a very intense yeshiva environment and, of course, also communicate to people who did not have a yeshiva experience at all? Understanding that inner dynamic. It's very difficult to teach somebody who never learned what Shabbos is or kosher Start telling the law, it can be very overwhelming. But when you tell them that the Torah teaches you the purpose of your life, and that purpose is fulfilled through keeping Shabbos, it's a whole different story. <coughs> you can relate to that. It's relevant. I'm not suggesting it has to only be in one, that direction. Whatever works, works. But generally speaking, you speak to people, you get them to relate to God when it becomes your God. A God that is my soul at work here. My actualization of my uh, purpose here. The Rajbi, right before he passed away, he asked that this day, Sunday, like Bomber, should be a simcha, a celebration. He's only, the only uh, yard site that we celebrate in that type of way. It comes, for example, Zayn Other, the, the yard site of Moses, some people fast. And Lag Bomer, Rajbi, insisted that it be Yem Simchose, a day of celebration, to the point that there was a Talmud of his, that there was, I'm sorry, there was a sage who, um, who every day would, would uh, bring an uh, offering in the temple uh, for repentance. And as a result, he was, uh, he was in a sense punished because Rajbi was not happy that he did in Lagba Omer. So Lagba Omer is considered a celebration. Now, how could you call a death a celebration? It's true thousands of years later, well, not thousands, we're like 1,800 years later now, you could say, today we only celebrate. But he said it to his students then. What did he expect them? Not to sit shiva for him? You know, halakhically, you have to grieve over, especially a tzaddik, a teacher. But Rajbi, being a person from the inner world of the spirit, understood that the, even though we, don't see the, we, don't, we cannot see behind the curtain, the real pain of death is a result of, no, of, of, of this fact that even though those souls see us, we don't see them. So it doesn't, there's no pain on, this side, on that side of the curtain. The pain is on this side because we can't see. We can't see the connection. And we feel that there's like two different worlds or it's like disappeared. Rajbi comes from that world and lived that world. He was all Nuna Yama, like the fish in the sea, always connected to the source. He, it says in some, the Hill of Paracha, a great chassid said once, wrote once in the name of the Alter Rebbe, that for souls like the Rajbi, there was no churban. Those souls did not experience destruction. Because there's a place in the cosmos that is like beyond the symptom that does not feel the pain, does not experience the pain of, of this world. And even though it relates to it, but it's from a different place. So Rajbi gave us, in a sense, a gift. You know, like Bahama is a day that's a very mysterious day. Nobody really understands what this day is about. I mean, yes, it's the day that he passed away. But you see the celebrations, children are taken to the fields and uh, celebrations and parades, whatever it may be. There are all kinds of different ways. And it's not really clear, like, you know, what, what exactly are we celebrating? But it's part of this mystery of Rajbi introducing into this world a joy. Interestingly, it happens right in the middle of the days of Sphira. 
because this is the days where the children, the students of Rabbi Akiva died in an epidemic because of their divisiveness. Rajbi was one of the students of Rabbi Akiva who taught that love is paramount, and he was one of those that did not, was not part of that divisiveness. So in a way, right in the middle of a sad period, Rajbi introduces joy. Again, teaching us that within the darkness, even when you're lost, there is light. And just as a parallel, the Arizal, Ziyar Tzait, if you may know when it is, it's also in an interesting period, the fifth of Av, right in the nine days, right between Rosh Chodesh Av, smack between four days before Tisha B'av, the saddest day in the year, Arizal has a yard site. I discussed this once, I think, a few years ago at length. Anyway, to sum it all up, let me say this. I think that uh, you know, for me it's a great honor to intersect with uh, souls like yourselves and those that are on, in cyberspace. Um, so even though the technology is the connection, but the souls are still there. Um, because um, as the Baal Shem Tov says, every God leads the footsteps of people. The reason we meet um, may be for all kinds of ostensible external reasons, but the main reason we meet is because there's something that we can uh, help each other with, which means there's something I can offer you and something you could offer me. And uh, in the context of our higher purpose, you know, I was blessed to be in the right time, the right place, and uh, heard the right things. Um, and I see also we live in a world where we are all lost souls. I include myself in that category in some ways. But we're also in a place where we can, um, we have some awareness and we can wake ourselves, each other up. So uh, it is really a, an honor to be part of a, another person's life's journey because uh, Part of the honor is also the mystery of it. It's not like you always know where it's going to go, but you know it's, something's happening. And when we set our minds to it and we, um, and we focus on the, on the bigger picture as opposed to the immediate here and now, things emerge. You know, there's all kinds of fascinating and uh, rich experiences that I've had that I had not taken upon myself some of the things I do, I would never have experienced. And it's amazing, the journey. So though there are many things in life that are difficult and challenging, I just wanted to share that and uh, in a way say thank you as well. And I hope that um, each of you in your own way, the people you intersect with, uh, look at it like creating the connections. The Kabbalists like to say that each of us is allocated with a certain amount of divine sparks. You know, those divine sparks are embedded and buried and hidden in the places that you're going to travel to, where you'll be tonight, where you'll be tomorrow, where you'll be the next day, the people you meet, the opportunities that come your way. And every one of them is an opportunity. So a good businessman, wherever he goes, he's always looking for opportunities. And a good spiritual journeyer, a soul journeyer, is looking for spiritual opportunities, recognizing that there's always a reason that you're interacting, there's something to be done. Now, that we, all of us can have that type of intensity all the time to be on call in that way, it's a, I don't know. But moments, for sure. And uh, once a day, twice a day, three times a day. And after a while, it grows on you and becomes pretty um, exciting. It also helps to relieve the monotony of life. Because maybe the greatest challenge of all is the boredom. The routines, the monotony. The, you know, we look for new highs. And when a person doesn't get excitement and passion in healthy things, they will go elsewhere. That's the rule of the game. That's how it works. So understanding that everything that you meet, every experience you have is a potential, um, a potential explosive energy waiting to erupt based on your catalyst, based on your action, that gives life a whole different type of meaning. Everything, therefore, is full with, filled with uh, potential power. And it's a, it's a way of looking at life. It's a way of taking control of your life as opposed to life taking control of you. So... So on this day, Pesach Sheni, when there's Neshtokim Fafal, the point is, no matter how uh, lost or how, uh, uh, let's put it this way, how, um, how the, what's the word, how, you have the word? Not fatalistic. If you've given up hope on yourself, here's a day that reminds us that there's no way, that, that there's no reason to do so. But you have to do something. You have to cry out at times. You have to uh, wake yourself up. 
so hopefully some of these words can help um, um, energize and uh, serve as a little wake-up call. And, uh, and I want to say if anybody needs any particular specific thing that cannot be addressed, like, you know, in a generic way in a group, um, you can feel free to call on me and call on uh, Velva right here. And I want to also say that this class is dedicated by Philip Namaworth in memory of the birthday of his father, Naftali ben Eliyahu, who was born Pesach Sheni 100 years ago. That's interesting. Um, 5671. Okay. Um, and also the memory of the author of his brother, Eliyahu ben Naftali, on the 20th of year, and the memory of his cousin, Rachel, Rachel Bas Anna. And finally, a memory of the Yetzirah of Nancy's grandmother, Lily's great-grandmother, Yehudit Bat Yisrael. If you know Philip, Philip is very thorough. He made sure everybody's covered here. So, a lot of Yetzirahs here. Um, and I want to say finally that uh, if you're here for the first time, I, uh, I'll please stay in touch. If you uh, haven't left your email, please leave us your email address. We can uh, give you updates about the classes or any other new things that come up. And again, more importantly, if there's anything I can do or uh, we can do for you and your journey, you don't hesitate to uh, call upon us. So uh, I don't know how you're celebrating like Omer, but um, there are many ways to do so. If you'd like some ideas, you can come over to me afterwards and I'll give you, I could share some. And meanwhile, until our next uh, segment, the next segment, which will be next Wednesday night, I bid everybody a pleasant evening. And also announcing that Philip will be giving his class tomorrow night at 7 p.m. So uh, either email us or con call, contact us. We'll tell you where it is. It's not here. It's at a different location. And finally, very good night. Thank you. <laughs>